what is up humans of the internet and the world the earth that we have here uh i'm pretty excited today because as you know learning with bell vista studios is an opportunity for myself and the team to speak with people that we're curious about and mo you put out a post on linkedin which i want to thank you for because it exposed me to new stuff that i was not aware of so number one learning tick yay hey. And the second part of that is uh, challenging my thinking. So thank you for that. And as a result, I want to dive deeper into it. So Mo, you got some cool things going on. Um, but I want to set the scene for people before I get into your brain and what you're about. So I'm going to share my screen because your post was around um, comic books and heuristics heuristics i've heard of but i haven't really like got into it before so that's why i was like i need to learn from mo and this podcast is all about learning so to set the scene for people bear with me mo for a moment we're gonna i just put up two random things on the internet because it's about visual storytelling that this podcast and video is about today this one is from the ice age to instagram and if we go way back into history we've got like these cave drawings then we've got um, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, where that's the first place where images and text came into the world. Um, here's like some images and visual storytelling on a pot. Then we go to things in the like Middle Ages, which is this is the Book of Kells. I'm familiar with it because I'm from Ireland, but it's basically like the gospel stories. Um, this other little blog and these blogs are in the description if anyone's interested, but just more visual storytelling happening here where this is a bronze mirror and you can see the etchings. And I'll just scroll down to show more in some sort of limestone they've carved stories keep scrolling keep scrolling just to give everyone a taste of back in the day what storytelling was like before Pixar and Disney and Quentin Tarantino came along here's a tapestry um yeah and then i'm yeah. just gonna go back like it. you said quentin <laughs> well i saw your picture so <laughs> you're gonna build that rapport mo you know how it is <laughs> this one here is uh the first ever photo photo that was taken um this one here is a visual representation of data so it's like to do with cholera and deaths around this water pump so they started using shading for the first wow. time um and this that is was, the first that movie. was one huge intervention huge mm. intervention in science but saw a whole documentary about that one. Oh, really it, it, oh yeah it, it, if it wasn't for that the, there would have been a huge epidemic a huge epidemic because Whoa. sewage water was mixed with water and they needed to do it and there was massive spread of disease and they didn't know how it started so if it wasn't for this people mm. would have actually went for witchcraft and everything that is like meta obsolete instead of going for factual understanding of what could cause a disease this is huge this this picture is huge wow oh, didn't even know it was that big i was just like no it's a shitty little <laughs> graph thing <laughs> no. <laughs> no but i love the significance thank you for bringing more relevance to it um yeah all the way up to like what we know about instagram facebook and like movies emojis of today so mo i'll the, the link to your actual post and you've got a five minute video which i recommend people check out um is very valuable and that has piqued my curiosity for what i wanted to chat to you today i'm just going to play it a minute because it is around comics so i just want for anyone that's not familiar with comic storybook just to be watching that well i kind of get into the depths of your post and what you said was comics are supreme storytelling quote unquote and that they affect the way we craft our learning experiences one of the things that you said that really resonated in this video to me was that it can impact our view of the world and in particular our judgments tell me more okay well um the point is people always consider comics to be something that is uh, shallow irrelevant or um how can i say trivial yet comics was political back when it started. I mean, it was a representation of our own society. 
and it did lead to a lot of protesting and it did help with um, gathering up the masses, as a matter of fact. Like, even if you go back to the history of comics, and I don't want to get like all nerdy on this, but um, I'll allow you, can you. See, <laughs> <laughs> you can see how like ethics, norms, customs have changed all the way to, to now. And for instance, for instance, um, when they first introduced Superman, mm. Superman was a great comic and he was one of the first uh, superheroes that were ever there. But the problem is that Superman, I, I believe that was in 1953, I suppose, they started to introduce Kryptonite, although Superman started to come out in the 30s. Because Superman was more of a messiah. He was more of an indestructible person and that was not relatable to people see when when comics start to stray away from our own norms and our own understanding we start to de-associate ourselves from it and it doesn't become that relevant or powerful or impactful and when you start to include a sense of vulnerability or something that we can take a lesson out of okay it's okay that's cool. But when Superman turns into more of a god that nothing affects him, that becomes a problem. And that's why you see in most comics that they're orphans or they're having like huge issues, like Batman, for instance. Um, I'm, I'm a DC fan, so you would find me relating a lot <laughs> to DC comics. But uh, yeah, and also there's Marvel and well, all of what's happening in it. And fun <laughs> fact that I started reading Marvel first, but DC, they're gods among men, so couldn't is help Is that it. why? Is that particularly uh, why you've switched to DC? I don't know, but DC, the thing is, like, DC is Detective Common, and Detective Comics started off with Batman, and uh, if I'm going to nerd on that one as well, um, he's extremely relatable. Away from being a billionaire, hmm. but he's extremely <laughs> relatable, because he, he uses his wits his uh, means of observation, analytical skills. Kids, well, they're not really kids anymore, but kids back in the days, until now, they eat up on the concept of, okay, analytical thinking could work. I could do this. This is possible. I could do that, and so on and so forth. And, um, and comics at that time wasn't really important, but to certain people, until in 1989, when Tim Burton introduced a new Batman hmm. and things started to change if it wasn't for Batman back in 1989 we wouldn't have seen Marvel now and all the good movies that you can see because he started put, to put it into pop culture and now these days I was just reading a couple of articles um, on comics uh, there's the S what was it called so, so, SGW, yeah, the SGW, which is social justice workers, the social justice workers movement in comics where they're trying to normalize like the uh, everything that is ethnocentric, ethnocentric uh, all of the ideas that may, might be modern, the LGBTQ plus community. I mean, some people are with it, others are not. I mean, I'm kind of against a couple of things because you're kind of ruining the classics, but it's speaking about the culture. Again, it's affecting the way we see the world. And most of the people are against it because you don't really need to force comics on us and force ideas. We vibe towards it. You don't try to like pressure us with it. And that's the fine line that I try to put up that when you're trying to force your learning experience on learners, you're not engaging them you're forcing them. It's like passive learning and click, click, reveal and, 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 and knowledge dumps. That doesn't work. You cannot knowledge dump in a comic, like from an aesthetic perspective, putting loads of text. And, 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 and from, a, from an ideation perspective, you can't really force your understanding. It has to be done with a little bit of finesse. Show me actions, show me results, show me purpose. People, I always say this word, People are purpose maximizers, not profit maximizers. Give me meaningful impact. 
and I'll, and I'll vibe, I'll come to it, but don't try to pressure me into it. Mm. So that, that was a little bit about comics, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I want to go deeper into a couple of things you've said. Just going off the last thing you said with the actions, the mm-hmm. purpose, the meaningful impact, what are some specific tangible things people can do in learning to achieve that? Okay, so comics uh, and, and, and anime, as a matter of fact, because uh, a friend of mine, uh, actually a, a very prominent person in LD, his name is Dr. Peter Shia. He showed me how they teach manga, uh, how they teach biochemistry using manga, which is the Japanese version of, of comics and it helps. So how is that? We use branching scenarios all the time. We use uh, uh, learning that has a lot of interaction and engagement. But the point of the matter is, if the branching scenario doesn't have a story structure, doesn't have sequence, doesn't have harmony, it falls out of line. It doesn't make any sense. Commas gives that. Commas give you that structure that you can build on. And that structure is stemmed out of behavioral science and user experience. Mm. So from a behavioral science perspective, let's take it this, this, this way. We build up on something called heuristics. Heuristics are mental shortcuts that I utilize, that I work on to help people make decision making. Mm -hmm. And before we get into like heuristics per se, um, anything that is repeated more than once, people start to perceive it as true. That's why we use space repetition and micro learning, for instance, or we use like small bites and we keep on reinforcing because the more you show me something, the more I start to, you know, what the fuck? Makes sense. It's logical. <laughs> so this is called this is called cognitive ease. Hmm. So cognitive ease is when you make me get repeated into something over and over again until you know what this makes. This makes perfect sense. If you don't believe me, look at what the election did on Facebook and look at what people are doing with TikTok and look what people are doing with social media. It becomes easy and it goes on a margin. I mean, they're not all easy in in thought or like mental effort. It goes from flipping through your social media, like the scroll down process all the way to the hard part of like trying to multiply 67 by by 22 in your head it it, it depends if you do it more than once well it becomes easy Mm. it's too easy we'll go for it so it becomes remembered Mm. but there's a huge difference between getting remembered and getting anchored so i remember something Mm -hmm. but i anchor something that's something else anchoring something depends on how you could relate it to your usual behavior, your long-term memory, your ability to, 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 to do something, your work experience, for instance. So that's why when we do a branching scenario, we try as much as possible in learning analysis to understand the audience, their norms, their contextual analysis of the environment, their social, uh, their social, their social environment itself, like the, 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 the status of how their work is like. Mm-hmm. Um, we try to understand their their te- their technological liabilities and what do they work, work on. So we wouldn't be introducing something that wouldn't work with them, or their and also their culture. And then we take that. We do our TNA training needs analysis on how do we, what kind of performance that we want to work on. We action map it to figure out the kind of actions that would get that performance within that specific context, and we form a story upon it. So we form a story with familiar characters that they see every day, and we use performance measures that that matches their environment. And here, cognition becomes easy because, well, that's something that has been repeated that I know about it. It's a no-brainer. I could go through it. And... Here is the time I I introduce availability heuristic. Mm. So the availability heuristic is 
it, 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 it reduces my mental effort. It makes anything that is, sim that is complex more simple. And as I encapsulate within that, the new technique, the new model, the little piece of knowledge that is there, it flows. So it helps them in making decision-making because I have removed all of the constraints of them understanding something new. And I'm, I'm just isolating them into exactly what I want them to focus on, hmm. which is applying a new knowledge, applying a new set skill. And that's what happens in behavioral science. And uh, yeah, that's basically when it comes to, to availability, I suppose, like one of the heuristics. Simple, simple. And um, that applying bit, could you give me an example of what one might look like? Uh, applying which exactly? Like, yeah, so applying, if they've got, so your process is you understand the people you're designing for. I'll recap this for listeners mm -hmm. as well. Understand the people you're okay. designing for in their world. Then you action map to get decisions and actions. And then you create scenarios that are relatable. And you talk about anchoring that part of it to allow oh, them okay. to apply mm -hmm. it so what would be an example of that um well i do i do teach instructional design classes mm. so one of the things that i work on is that you know what here are highlighted uh uh like um high-end learning objectives yeah. and those are the modules i don't want you to think about anything else and then i present present to them an, a branching scenario with three different SMEs. They pick the SME and they find that there is like stats. What can they do? What can they not do? What could they offer? How can they help? And I tell them, review the three SMEs, see which you will go for and continue on a conversation with them. So they're already used to dealing with an SME. They already know the good SME, the bad SME, the SME that doesn't have time. And they take a really long time into deciding which SME that they want. And I'm intending for them to go into that kind of conflict, which is okay. Mm. And then they choose an SME. They continue on the conversation. They go through the plan of what to do with an SME, with each their own characteristics and each their own uh, constraints of some sort. One that tells, for example, Kim, yeah, I've been uh, working in uh, delivering trainings before, so I could have dabbled in it, so I could help you with the design. <laughs> and another would be like, no, I know nothing about learning and development, but I have research and I have papers and I have and I have and I have. And another guy would be like, I only have like hands-on experience with no references or no updates. What will you do? How would you get like concrete information out of this? And some people, they finish the, the branching scenario and they finish the conversation. And once they're done, they go into another SME and I'm, I'm intending for them to do something like that. Some do, some don't. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I tell them, so which was the best SME? Some will be like, yeah, I went for the veteran. I went for the researcher. The other will be like, yeah, I went from the inside guy because he seems nice. <laughs> but although he's kind of a prick, but he seems nice. So, um, at the end, I told them, well, none of them is the correct answer. All of them are the correct answer. We need an SME who's a reviewer, one is an approver, another is a provider, and we see what is possible to us. So I've let them go into the application of what to do in the interview itself. Mm. I've presented them with already easy understandings of each and every type of SME that they've possibly went through before or even read about. The conversation is simple nothing hard about it, but the technique of going through the plan and taking a decision about which is which is the learning that I want to put within the whole thing. And afterwards, I just do a reflection on what works. This is one way to it. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for breaking it down like that. I think there's lots of learning to pull from that example that you've just shared. Um, I'm going to go back again to allow you to be more nerdy because I love that Tim Burton example of how that kind of changed comic books. Were there other, and storytelling, was there any other pivotal moments that you're aware of? You might not be, um, in terms of comics changing the way people received information or communicated or changed their worldviews 
or did something different as a result? Any movements that you're aware of and why it played out that way? It's not, it's not the like pivotal moments, but um, let's see. Well, there are different types of, of comics and mm. to stray a little bit away from comics, in a, but not too away. Mm. People are more drawn to manga and anime. Okay. And there were like American comics and comics in general, Western type of comics should really learn from Japanese comics. Why? Mm. Emotion. Raw, raw emotion. <laughs> big production when it comes to anime i mean <clears throat> we just converted a guy with us at the gym to start watching anime and he's he's <laughs> getting addicted to attack on titans these days wow. <coughs> why good storytelling really good storytelling so it, it it japan was one of those countries that really worked on their um how can i say it culture cultural broadcasting if that's even a word but like they started to broadcast the kawaii kind of culture and uh, how cute and and all because well japan has been actually known to be very fearsome very bloody and mm. they had a really raw raw gruesome type of history but when you look at the pop culture of japan now you find sailor moon and the cute kawaii and the anime and and, and they've worked on themselves way too much same as k-pop by the way like k-pop mm -hmm. k-culture and all of that it's showing emotion letting people relate to how they think every day and giving them like okay meaning like most of the people here in the middle east we've been brought up with anime true we saw the gi joes and defenders of the earth and and He-Man and Shira, all of that is in the box. We've been through that. But anime, we came out of it with lessons. We came out of it with what to do in life. Like Grandizer and Messenger and like, uh, how can I, what else? Um, but the thing is, uh, most of them are in Arabic, so I'm trying to find the, the, the naming, but mm. because it, it comes dubbed. But the point is, we come up, we come up with a lot of lessons, and that's why we love them more. Mm. So, uh, what I would say in pivotal moments that comics started to learn this more from manga mm. and anime, and for people that don't know what manga is, manga is the Japanese comics, and then anime is the animation of the manga. So they started to learn from them, putting that sense of purpose and putting more story, more raw emotion in it to make people like vibe towards it. That's it. That's what I would say more of a pivotal moment. It all plays on basic psychology to be completely honest. Well, that's, it's really curious. This intrigues me a lot because I quite often try to figure out how to do this in learning where you can read a comic or any kind yeah, I let's stick to comics for now they're okay. not telling you exactly like be a good person because of xyz like okay. it's it's almost like subliminal messaging I guess how do they do that like what do you can you identify any of the characteristics well the, let's just say first they play with archetypes okay which is, which is in behavioral science called representative, uh, representativeness heuristic. So the representativeness heuristic is that I don't really need to tell you, Kim, that this is a protagonist or this is an antagonist. Their actions would tell. And from an aesthetic perspective, this is how they would look like. I mean, you go into a movie, <laughs> you can't really tell who's the hero and who's the villain. And that's why, for instance, Game of Thrones was mind-blowing. Like, you make us hate someone, and then we, like, Jamie Lannister, for instance. Many people didn't really like Jamie Lannister after the first two episodes. <laughs> Sister? Really? I don't get it. Although it's normal back in, like, medieval and before times, but and what's 
then you'll love the guy. You'll love the, 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 the Kingslayer. You like someone, you hate him. This is what made it so good, Game of Thrones, <laughs> because it played on a totally different thing. I'm, I'm, I'm diverting. It, play, it plays on a totally different thing that gives um, a means of rewarding. I'll get to the representative when I say yeah, this. Yeah, go, go, go. Okay, um, Tender. Tender. Why do we love Tender? Why are we so addicted to it? addicted to it? Not me. I'm married. I mean, no more. But yeah, back back then, because <laughs> you see, you see a lot of choices, a lot of choices, and it plays on the and the unpredictability of it. You swipe right, you swipe left, and you don't even know who would match. That thing on its own gives you a huge rush of dopamine. Like, it works. I got that person. And accordingly, the, 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 the connection becomes instant because we don't really need to build that much rapport because you read my bio, you saw my picture. Well, let's see what we could do. That's why it leads to many unethical like behavior later on. But unpredictability people love unpredictability because it crosses what the representative heuristic says so the representative heuristics makes you have that ease of cognition that i understand who's the protagonist who's the antagonist in my video i said one of those tools is um the uh zero to hero hmm. we all had that person at work who knew nothing, still starting off, got into their induction, and they're building up. So when I see a representativeness of a protagonist, who's me, mm. and I go through it, I don't need, need to tell you this is the induction. I'm telling you how to get better at the, at the organization, how to do the best practice, and I'm showing you stories. And one, one time before I saw it in uh, an e-learning that I co-created is that we took like pictures from the organizations, from the organization, we made it into tunes, and then we let people like look at it. So when they're at work, they'll be like, okay, this looks like, this looks like my office. This looks like <laughs> HR. I don't need to tell them. I don't need to tell them this is the representation. I just mm. put it there. Okay. Um, also, there's another one called the, uh, the the awakening, which is I'm getting the worst type of manager, the worst type of employee, and then they're going into their road of salvation. How would they be able to, to be better? So I'm giving them everything that they should not do and the antidote to it as they go on and progress and see the consequences of how that would help mm. like we were teaching before kpis and we told them in the e-learning itself how wrong kpis would be and someone that has awful kpis with their team members one and two and three and four happen and as they go forward the e-learning was sort of like um um pokemon collect it all kind of thing where they're trying to collect their team back by altering their KPIs and seeing how that would make the whole team get back together. And the ultimate goal was to get the team back by changing their KPIs, which is key performance indicators, to make them understand how to get team formation by truly knowing how to understand their, their performance measures, coach them, and take them forward. So this is the representativeness heuristic and a bit of storytelling to make people get easy into the learning instead. APIs are, KRAs are. Doing this is numerical, not qualitative. In order for you to write it, click next. Okay, and afterwards, here's a video to explain what KPI is. KPIs are blah, 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 blah. <laughs> who, 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 who cares? It reminds me of, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you a story. I used to, uh, my background's in human resources, by the way. Hmm. So I, I took a certificate or possibly a diploma actually in something called CIPD, 
which is a big thing for us in HR. And first session I attended, first two sessions, the two hours of that session, I was listening to the history of CIPD. <laughs> How it started with the Quakers. The Quakers, the people who, who, who started the whole concept obviously very of effective to now recall it now. <laughs> You had emotional pain, though. That's where it's coming from, not pleasure. Agony. <laughs> Agony. I was like, how would that help me do my job better? Mm. Who cares? I mean, it could help me maybe in who wants to be a millionaire, but it's not, it's not going to help me do my job knowing who did what. That's the point. That's why we do actual mapping. Mm. So, yeah. This is very, very cool. You're exposing me to a lot of things that I know nothing about, but I look forward to experimenting with. Do you have a, almost like, I don't know, other questions you, when you're designing scenarios, right? You're talking about a lot of things that I'm just like, got to try that, got to experiment with that, can see the value in that. So when you're designing scenarios, do you have a checklist or a set of questions you ask yourself to make sure that you're hitting on the things that you're doing? I'm like, for you, it seems like it comes so naturally, but to build the skills for those that are new to this, what would your recommendations be? Um, yeah, um, building scenario and building um, building a story. Mm. Well, I'm I'm no storytelling like guru or something. I mean, I'm I'm self taught in this. They obviously they can go and like read the book story designed by Rancy Green, that, that's, 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 that's big. But um, you really need to, you really need to look into what kind of storyline that you want to go through. Mm. The Gustav Freytag 150 years ago, or possibly more even, uh, there's something called the, the story arc, which is a universal story structure that almost every story ever existed falls under it. So it starts with the um, with the expose, the introduction, how things are. So in, in our world of e-learning, we could do the expose, the introduction into a, maybe a small typography video, maybe just a representation of a couple of characters, like how uh, Teresa did, you know, remember Teresa. Yeah. So like how she did it, just a simple introduction, setting the mood and the thing to what's going to happen. And then afterwards, we do something called a rising action, which is explaining how the problem works and who is being affected by it. When you say who's affected by it, you start to put, okay, so this is the protagonist. These are the supporting people, like here's the dispatcher, here's the helper, that's, that's Gandalf. That's Frodo, that is Legolas, that's whomever that's in, in it. Like, mm. I don't know why I went to Lord of the Rings, but this is how <laughs> my brain works now. Yeah. <laughs> so rising action, and then climax. Problem is, is presented. There has to be a solution that comes in it. And after the solution comes in, we go into the falling action, which was... We're going into the resolution. Protagonist starts to understand. Lessons are being learned. Things are being reflected. Reinforcement happens. We should let them know the do's and the don'ts. And then we end with the dunement, the closure. So this is the universal structure, but it differs mm -hmm. from one person to the other. Meaning, we have something called the monomyth, which is Spider-Man, Lion, uh, Lion King, uh, any movie where there's, I go into an, the unknown and I'm trying to get back with new form wisdom of some sort or a treasure or the princess or anyway, Indiana Jones. So this is a, a story structure that goes into the climax, could get extended all the way to the end and the following action the, and the exposition, uh, sorry, the following action, the dunamo happens so quickly. We have the, uh, the mountain. So the mountain is that it's like TV series, like like Game of Thrones. Climax, 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 cliffhanger, climax, 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 climax. So you're spreading the tension 
across the entire asset. So it's not when we're doing e-learning or when we're doing any learning of some sort, it doesn't have to be e-learning. It's a struggle and another struggle and another challenge and another battle and another something you're getting. And then what would be even better is to chunk the, the problem. So you learn this, let's accumulate it on the other one. So you reinforce it. So if we're using cognitive ease over time, by the end of it, it makes sense. And I like to use that technique a lot, the mountain. Um, there's in medias res. Hmm. In medias res, which is I throw you in the middle of the action. Like, and it was raining. I didn't know what to do. Should I go back to the airport or should I run to the pharmacy? The situation is dire. We have to find a solution. It's only one hour left. You'd be like, what the hell is going <laughs> on? I, I need to get to the bottom of this. And then the story starts from, from the beginning. Mm. People like this kind of stuff. You could put this, for instance, like um, a video at the beginning of the e-learning. You're telling them you're doing this. You're in the middle of that. You could do this through a twine, maybe. Um, and you start the, the, the whole uh, story. And as you go into the story, you're waiting for the moment where you were at this part and how am I going to be experiencing it? Yeah. Um, there's another one called the spark lines. So spark lines is, and we used to, I used to do this like years back, like 12 years back when I first learned about it and I didn't even know it was called spark lines. It's like giving a learning about everything that is wrong. And by it, you're learning everything that is right. That's one way. Yeah. It was tricky, it was fun, as a matter of fact, because people started to laugh and they would start to reflect. <laughs> and there's another way is like the movie, um, do you know the movie Equilibrium with the monks? And they used uh, to take like- Is Christian Bale in it? It's like exactly. very white, yeah, yes. They yeah. would take the Prozac and the Prozac would make them emotionless. So what did we learn by the end of this movie? Well, that we should have emotions and life has good and the bad. They didn't say that, that's the, the movie. So this is a spark line. It's telling you a reality of what is owed to be. And you start to compare it with your own reality to understand what it is. Mm. So. One of the things um, I used to I used to be um, I used to work in a company where I would create board game simulations. So we would give them at the beginning. This is a program on plan, uh, strategic planning and organizing. The situation of the company right now is one and two and three and four. They have uh, ruined this. They have done that. The problem was one and two and three and four throughout the program. Let's see how we can get them back on track. I didn't tell them this was bad. I was telling them, okay, this is the situation, how we will make it better. And that was the essence of the whole board game. It was a spark line. And once they were done with the two day game, what did we learn? How did it work? How can we take this back to work from an OGT perspective, like on job training later on, how it would work. So uh, yeah. Those are like some of the uh, storytelling techniques, I suppose, like some of them. Ah. I, I believe there are more, but I can't really remember them. I don't want to be saying wrong stuff. Mm. No, you, the, I'm just like, oh, my mind is blown. I, like I'm getting a lot of value from this. So thank you. The things that you are sharing, pleasure. you're exposing me to a lot of things that I really want to experiment with. Um, so one you have mentioned it a couple of times like with the heuristics and you're naming a couple of them mm -hmm. i like you could tell me more I, d I was like oh maybe there's like three but now there seems to be more what the hell are they about uh, there's a lot yeah and what what's their purpose or the intent of them okay the intent of heuristics heuristics by the way is a double-edged sword mm. it can trick us if it was used badly and i i didn't mention this but yeah I did see that uh, in a definition I looked up and I was like, 
this cheeky little yeah. it's all like good 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 and then the last thing is like if it's used for good or something <laughs> if it's used for good if and only if if conditional <laughs> if see it can it's used in marketing it's used in branding it's used in so many things uh, uh, what i'm saying is we're instructional designers we're learning designers we're using this for good i mean we're using this to teach people. Yeah, so, sure we are. Like to educate people. <laughs> we are. <laughs> in a way, in a way. We're the good guys. Um, so it can it can be an awful thing because like one of the things is uh, one of the heuristics is called the anchoring bias. Mm. So the anchoring bias is basing all of your understanding on the first impression that you get. So you could be putting like an anchor or a focal point or a reference as a starting point and you base everything on it. So it can easily be, I am putting something wrong and then I offer repetition to it and mm -hmm. people will get into it. And that would tell you the following. If we do not do our due diligence and research and offer proper knowledge, people can get diluted into something that is not. It's one way to put it. Representativeness here is the, the one that I was ex explaining before. Well, I could make an antagonist that does wrong things, or I can actually be, make people appeal too much for the protagonist himself, who will be like, you know, we, 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 we weren't good enough to that guy. He was, he was good. Or we relate more to the protagonist other, unlike the antagonist. So it's, it's, it's a tricky situation mm. to play with people's cognition, that's not <laughs> easy. And, and the point is people, not people, learning designers always talk about like, we can change people's behavior. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't, we totally do not. Mm. And, and, and it's always been an issue with me to like, I want to work in learning design. I want to work in training and development, learning and development to change people. No, we don't. You cannot do that. I mean, it's it's out of your power. Like, you don't have the power to do something like that. Yeah. Even if you're superhuman, you can't really do it. What we can do is what we can create an environment where people can start to take decisions within it and intrinsically they take the decision of change mm -hmm. because change comes from the people. And even though Learning and change is semi-permanent. Not permanent. Mm -hmm. Because Kim could read something new, learn something different, and change on her understanding. Because what happened to her was a cognitive conflict. A cognitive conflict is a shock or a dissonance that happens to your beliefs, your experience, your structure. But you know what? It makes sense. And it kind of challenges how you're thinking. And if I offered you enough logic, enough relatability, you'll be like, hmm, that could work. That could work. Um, because in order for us to make people go through that kind of change, we really need to offer them different types of appeals. We need to really make them take their time mm. in getting it because it's not a momentary change. It takes time for someone to take a decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, decisions can be so easy when I want to like click like on Instagram or Facebook because mm -hmm. it appeals to me. But if I'm going to be making a purchase, not a shirt, a car, um, a house, you go through a lot. You'll look into a lot to do something like this. And I'm going to nerd again and say something. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> what laptop do you have? It is a Lenovo. Wait, and the one before it was? A Dell. Good. So when you decided to change from Dell to Lenovo, what did you do? Mm, Googled for a laptop with my specs in my price range. Okay. And once you started to want to get a Lenovo, have you noticed that you've seen a lot of Lenovo around you? Yeah. 
although they were always there, but you didn't notice them before. No, this is called the reticular activating system. It's been made for us for means of survival. We only look and get into attention of things that, that mean to us, have purpose, and, and, and are important to us. Like I wanted to, to get a new car. I had a Hyundai and then I got myself a Seat. And I didn't see Seat. Actually, when I bought a Seat, I thought it was so unique. No one has Seat like me. But I've been seeing it everywhere to the extent it's not a car. It's, it's a darn bicycle. Everyone has it. <laughs> so this is the reticular activating system. You start to see that thing. You gravitate towards it. This is what happens when people, when they find something that is relatable, that they're anchored to it, that, that it no longer has mutual confirmation. This is what leads later on to that change, to that decision of change. Mm. And if they found means of conformity, the others do it, it enforces that kind of change. If they're only on their own in it, true, some people would like to say, yeah, I'm going to be wearing that t-shirt other than anyone else, but standing out needs to have a lot of reasoning and a lot of, of solid structure for this to happen, which again gets us back that we offer the environment for them to do so. And let me add up by something. I know I've been talking a lot. I'm so sorry, but- Oh, no, um, this is all valuable. Otherwise I would have been like, internet's broken, see ya. <laughs> I am laughing it up. I'm taking so many notes. Well, there's- um, a very famous professor called B.J. Fogg, and he wrote the book Tiny Habits. And he talked about something called um, the behavioral change model. Mm. So B, which is the behavior, an action a person must do, would lead to, I'm sorry, it, it, in order for you to, to change that behavior, you need to have M, mm -hmm. which is motivation, influencing to do an action, A, ability, working on an action, and then T, trigger, which is forging a new behavior. This is how you do this, okay? So how does this happen? Now, on the grid or the graph that, that BJ Fogg said, motivation is either high or either low. And let me tell you about this. People are motivated by one of two things, Kim. A desire to gain or a fear of loss. I either mm. want to gain something new or I want, I'm, I'm fearing something that would happen. So motivation is not that tricky. It's, as a matter of fact, motivation is the byproduct of how we feel about things. Mm. So motivation, either high or low. And then in, 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 um, in equatance to the ability, it's either something that is hard to do or easy to do. Our ability to go through the branching scenario and apply the, the technique that you, mm. you have. Like for instance, the branching scenario that you have, cause I got your HCD before I bought it like two mm. years ago. And um, you had like a branching scenario of things to be done and you've dissected the action and you started to make the branching scenario accordingly. And if I do remember the manifesto, the manual that you had, it has to be possible and feasible for the person to do. So it's between hard to do and easy to do, which is the ability part. But mm. we have certain motivators that we should be weary of and we should work on. The motivations of pleasure, pain, fear, acceptance, and rejection. So motivation of pleasure, like the one with tender that I told you about, mm -hmm. pain, in something that I want to go away from and I put pain, pain doesn't have to be physical pain, mm. but um, if you lost a promotion, that's pain. If you got stripped out of money, that's pain. You lost an opportunity, that pain. And the brain sometimes can make pain be almost as painful as physical pain. If you don't believe me, look at stress and pressure that goes around everywhere. Mm -hmm. Our mind, our body doesn't really get the pain sensor. The pain sensor comes from the mind. Like if I have pain right now in my back, it's the mind signaling to my body that it's, mm -hmm. that it's pain. As a matter of fact, we don't see, we don't, we don't see, we don't hear. 
This is just signals the mind are, are showing up for us to understand. And um, that's pain. So pain has no religion. Has it's 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 omni. It's <laughs> it's agnostic to anything. Mm. It works according to how it should. And that's something that we need to understand. Then when we're putting to people representations of what is wrong, we shouldn't make them feel that much pain, but we should them be we should let them be cautious that it mm. could be painful. Okay, and then we have fear, which is the expectation of a negative feedback, acceptance that we're accepting a specific thing, and then rejection. Those are the motivators that we put for change behavior. And then the ability. Ability could be in, do I have the time to do this? Are there any means of social deviance? Is it physically mundane or is it physically enticing or entertaining to go through? Would it take money out of me? Would it take a lot of mental effort? And that's why people, if they got bored from our passive means of learning, they would just simply reject it. Or if they're entertained by the game, and when I say game, I don't mean jeopardy inside of e-learning, I mean a game or an interaction of some sort, they want to finish it all the way to the end. Mm. Although when we're planning the e-learning, we would say, okay, the client says, this should only take like 40 minutes or 30 minutes total because people wouldn't stay that long. Well, people do stay that long if it was fun. And for instance, people have video fatigue. No, people do not have video fatigue from meetings. People have you fatigue. They are fatigued mm -hmm. out of you because this is boring. If you don't believe me, go and watch Netflix for six hours and binge on whatever that you want to binge on. Yeah. And you know what? I'm going into it. If I'm entertained, I'm for Absolutely. it. So ability really depends on how you want to put it, mm. if it's affecting me or not. Okay, uh, I'm almost done here. Um, and then triggers. Triggers. Triggers are three things. Signal. When am I going to be putting this type of action? Let's say I'm making a micro learning campaign. What is the signal that I would show to people the thing that would prompt them to act? And then the facilitator. What's the catalyst that I'm using to let people do the action? Is it going to be um, a quiz? a quest, a video, an infographic? Is it going to be um, a talking video, cartoon? Um, is it going to be a text message? What type of facilitator, what type of catalyst I would include my learning in it? And then last one was the spark. The spark is making people so interested in something because you know what? And this is when everything makes sense. The spark was so nice because it was motivating to me. It got me pleasure. It was easy to do, and it, was, it didn't take that much ability. It kept on being facilitated in a proper way, and the signal is not hard. It actually is re repeated over time. So I would continue on doing it over and over, and the motivation will couple because every time I'm able to do it, and it makes me be able to do the one after, and the one after, and the whatever. And welcome marketing campaigns and e-learning campaigns and micro-learning campaigns to change culture, which leads to the following. The action line happens to be this way. An action line goes up from the high to the low, mm -hmm. triggers would fail if it's hard to do and has low motivation and triggers would succeed if they did mark on the right motivators, triggers and ability. How can we do this? Heuristics using aesthetics that are not convoluted, that are easy to understand. Like for instance, Amanda, um, can't remember her last name. Amanda, the the really nice lady. Can't remember. Is she the Aussie name. one? Yes, From the Australia? Aussie. One. Oh yeah, yep. yes. Amanda does some crazy stuff with with aesthetics. Her micro learning is all about something that is so nice, so attractive. People love to go see it. They eat up on how mm. gorgeous it is. Okay, so, and and I saw also the the like. The, the, the podcast that you've done before. Mm. And that's one of the things, it's a good facilitator. 
it's a good motivator. It's easy to do and go through. And if you repeat it, and if it's a story that continues on, a story that, you know what, I want to see what the protagonist will do all the way to the end. I want to continue on making decisions as we go one step to, to, towards the end of the story. Mm. Will the awakening happen? Will, will I find a closure to the story? Will I be able to understand where is that point where I started in media's rest and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. So it's aesthetics that shouldn't be extraneous, easy for me to work on. I've made my due diligence and research and analysis to know where to plant it. Mm. And then I put it in, in sense of bites, easy in the means of repetition, couples up on one another mm -hmm. and the storyline makes it all really easier for me to follow through so it's not cognitively hard for me to grip it i'm mo and that's my time <laughs> <laughs> mic drop thank you for that attending my tech talk <laughs> <laughs> that was so cool i yeah like i appreciate you doing this i've learned a lot it's I'm kind of processing a lot of things myself as well in what you're saying. Um, one of the things that resonated quite a bit was we don't change behavior. The individual, we kind of facilitating a process or an environment or an experience for someone to change their own behavior. But as you say, that kind of flows because they get information, they get more experience and they pick and choose. And only just this weekend I learned, because I'm learning a lot about psychology at the moment, and like I wrote a note for myself, which was a life message. But now I'm like, this is like a mini framework for um, learning design as well. And it's basically don't judge, advise or convince another. Instead, facilitate the space for reflection by asking questions. And then those questions allow a person to make their own actions and decisions. And I think that really oh, resonates. I... Say that. Yeah, go on. Some people... You know why? Because some people have something called motivated reasoning and confirmation mm. biases. Mm. Kim is wearing a hat. Yeah, Kim is, uh, Kim is a punk. She goes into punk rock and she likes that kind of music because she likes that. I mean, she could be just wearing a hat. Mm. But I am confirming a belief on my end. Mm. Motivated reasoning for instance, um, yeah, let me use something from the Middle East. Someone with a beard, okay? Terrorist. I'm brown. Well, I'm not brown, but yeah. Ter a terrorist, okay? Uh, why? Because he, he, he's, he has a beard. And this is a confirmation bias. I am trying to look now at any action that person would do to confirm the bias that I have. And motivated reasoning is I am so motivated towards it that my reason is almost flawed because human beings are emotional beings. If I am making a decision, I base it upon emotion yeah. most of the time. Because for instance, when you're buying a, a piece of like a tire, you always go, go into emotion. When you're trying to reject something and say no to something, you logicalize it. So you logicalize your relationships, you logicalize emotions, but you take decisions on, oh, it's red. It's so darn expensive, but you know what? I need, I need an Armani between like, oh, why? Mm. But, but because, yeah, because you start to logicalize an emotion that you have. But when you're trying to get into relationship, so, sorry, when you're trying to get into rejections, you start to put logic, not emotion. This is, this is human being. So when, let's say I'm trying to force them hmm. with an idea and I'm not using any appeals other than logic. Yeah. Wouldn't work. That's why Aristotle said that there are three types of appeals that we should always use. The logos, the pathos, and the ethos. So if I said, David Allen from Getting Things Done said this, who cares? <laughs> That's an ethos. Maybe you like David Allen. I don't like, maybe I don't like yeah. Stephen Covey. Or I do. 
So it's only 10%. Uh, okay, but logic says one and two and three. How many times they were convinced with logic? Many do, but not all. Uh, that's 25%, but pathos. I tell you a story. If you emotion and that lady with the long red hair did empathize so much with it. And it made sense because it changed her life. Oh, and that's why motivational videos are so like in. Not a person that gets motivated by it, kind of see through it in a way. I don't know. I just don't like it. Cause it's like, that's too pathos. I mean, where's the logos? So Aristotle said, collectively, they make up the appeal. So what you're saying is you're offering them only logos. You need to use pathos. Yeah. And then put the logos in it. And if you want to leave some references at the end, which is ethos, go ahead. Some people will be like, even though the reference, I don't know about it. Like Gallup said this. They don't even know if Gallup said it or not, or Deloitte, but you know, Gallup said it alongside it makes sense. And the story is good. Wow. Okay. For everyone listening or watching, you're probably going to want to save this and watch it back a couple of times because there's been so many bloody things that have come up that are important for us to learn and get better at and experiment with and just add certain things to your toolkit. Mo, to finish us up, what, what do you encourage people to take action on in their first step to experimenting with anything that will have a bigger impact if they do on the solutions they create? Um, I, I will go for something very simple, which mm. is when I, when I teach storytelling to, to, to trainers and designers, I tell them something. Mm. Don't explain a story to a 25, 35, 45 year old, spin it to a five year old. And how would you put that? You would put it in the simplest form. You wouldn't use sophisticated language. You would use aesthetics. You would use ways of, of, of transcendence that are so simple on our on, on, on almost, an, an almost a no-brainer so they can get it. We tend to fall into a bias, our, our own. I mean, we, we, we get into a bias on our own. And that bias is that um, this would be too awful. This would not be good. This would be, this would be, this would be too shallow. Or we get biased, and this is something I, I, I know I fall into, bias in a way that we like to, to say things. I am so biased towards Fantasia, comics, most of the games from our company, and the things that we do, like our program is called The Virtual Wizard. Another program is called The Alchemist, <laughs> all Empire. I am so into RPGs, and I'm and sometimes I fall into the bias. I was like, "Oh, the, the, I'm going to do the story of Hermes." We did it, and then my wife, who's my business partner and an instructional designer, would be like, "Aren't we too much into Fantasia?" <laughs> so be wary of those biases. Mm -hmm. Tell it to a kid. And after you tell it to a kid, make sure that the aesthetics over simplifies and compensates the amount of text. Mm. People don't read, Kim. People don't read. People hover. People skim. Uh, not everyone reads books from like start to end, but people like the story they see. They like the music, they like the animation, if you can. I mean, if you don't, if you can't do animation, you could, you could go to storysub.com, get yourself like free assets or humans. You could go and get yourself free as icons eight, get free assets and play with it. There's a tool that I like to use, it's called Create Studios. That's mm -hmm. not expensive, it's like $60. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's how I put the animation in my video. I'm just going to say. Oh. Yeah. It, you could do that. I, I, I cannot create animation to save my life, but this one helped me. Um, so 
don't don't convolute yourself got hooked up on the tool mm. think about the design think about the narrative and then you could simply just put an icon and it can tell what it is but go back to mayor's principles uh the multimedia principles the 12 principles that he has put you would find so much to be put there like the, the signaling, the proximity, the understanding of mental models, these are the things that will make your branching scenarios, your e-learning, your complete learning design way better. Cool. All right. I will summarize that answer as go read children's books and reverse engineer what they've done well and the messaging or the outcome that you get as a result of it. Mo, this Hello? has been an absolute pleasure. I'm so grateful to have had this time and opportunity to learn from you. Um, I have so many notes that I really promise you I will be putting into action with solutions that we create. So thank you for enabling that for me. Um, everyone that's Hello. listening, go give Mo some love, his details, his LinkedIn, all that. So you can go check him out and what he's about. And if you want to learn more from him are in the description. Ah, thank you. You are awesome. Thank you so much. You're the one who's awesome. <laughs> Glad to be here. No, thank you. Um, I'm I'm processing. That's why I'm like a bit silent at the moment. But I appreciate you and everyone. Go like take action on this and let us know what you actually experimented with and what you put into practice in terms of your learning solutions that you create. It'd be good to have like a library of cool things that came out of Mo's mind and into the world. <laughs> What's up, awesome human? Thank you, thank you, thank you on behalf of myself and the Bell Vista Studios team for continuously choosing to learn with us. We really appreciate it. If the tips and the insights and the context resonate with you and you want to take your skills to the next level or you want to make your life way easier, you will love our Creator Hub. The Creator Hub is a place for people like you and us, basically, it's the stuff that we use internally at Bell Vista Studios and then we just share it publicly with you. The Creator Hub is created by instructional designers for instructional designers. And what you'll love there at the moment is we've got a quiz, Could I Be a Better Instructional Designer, that has so much tips in the feedback if you're interested in human-centered design or just taking your skills to the next level in terms of the solutions you're creating, the problems you want to solve. But in there as well, Aren't we cute? That's us. Um, but we've got the coaching courses, freebies, give us gratitude, and also we've got some templates. And basically, they're always around the lens of learning experience design, instructional design, and e-learning. So a human-centered design focus is very much what we're about at Bell Vista Studio. So putting your learners at the heart of a solution and creating something for their needs. So there's the human-centered design stuff and then we've also got the business stuff. So this is the stuff they don't teach you about when you want to become a freelancer or a consultant in the instructional design world. So go check it out. The link is in the description. You can check out everything that is available for you. Thank you for choosing to learn with us. Continuously invest in your skills. You will be rewarded as an instructional designer. Share this stuff, share it with other people because when we are better instructional designers, we create better solutions that create better humans that create a better world. So we have a very important role and I'm excited to be on this journey with you. Have an awesome day.